Hello, I'm Sarah Davis Buchner, and I'm particularly pleased uh, to present this video uh, for tone based piano about the piano sonata in F major, Kurzweil 332 of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Uh, as this is a piece that's very near and dear to my heart, I studied it when I was quite young uh, and quite infatuated with the music of Mozart. And uh, it was at that time in my life, I was uh, seven or eight years old, that my parents bought me this. Uh, uh, bust of, uh, of our hero here, which I've kept uh, next to my piano for many, many years. He's uh, got a few chips and uh, acquired a, a nose shortening over the years. But um, uh, regardless of the nose, uh, he lives on, certainly in music like this. A very, very glorious sonata, one that is really kind of the height of the Viennese classical style. It's a very, very beautiful opening made of the simplest materials imaginable. I use the word simple, and that's a difficult word to use with the music of Mozart, because of course the sheen, the, the, the surface element of the music is intended to sound as easy as pie, but of course there are many difficulties inherent in that. First of all, one of the classic challenges of playing a good Alberti bass line, which is not merely playing the notes, but actually overholding the lowest note of that sequence slightly to provide a true pedal point. And that can be done both with the finger holding the note down and also a little touch of the pedal. Mozart would absolutely expect that kind of thing so that the harmonic underpinning becomes very clear. There's also a bit of trick to the expression of a legato melody like that, where one overholds the fingers just slightly from one note to the other. And then again, with the expert use of the pedal, then we try to produce exactly the kind of sound that a great singer or a great violinist would produce, something like that. And in using the word simple, I've of course neglected the fact that at measure five, we actually have a kind of canonic uh, element, which is not all that singable, but really quite interesting. So already here, Mozart is introducing the idea of the two hands talking to each other. There's that conversational element of you said this, I said this, uh, potato, potato, and then we move on. Then we come to the next element, sort of the counter subject. This is a small universe in which everything is in harmony and everything is very, very happy. And here are the two hands that had previously had a bit of a tiff with each other, are united. So it's very, very important, in the left hand particularly, to make sure that you bring out that melody. And I usually make my own piano students practice these kind of things with two hands to get the sound in their ear of what it is they're trying to replicate when they play it with one hand. so that we really create a duo here. Otherwise, I find that many pianists tend to sound a little bit too much right-handed when they play things like that. If I don't listen to the left hand, it could come out. But when I balance it properly, And here we have the first really important two note slurs that Mozart uses all the time in all of his music, not just keyboard music, vocal music, string music, operas, symphonies, etc. Very, very important to understand the feeling of the two note slur, down, up, down, up. And when I say down, up, I'm physically feeling the effect of dropping my hands and wrist into the keyboard and then pushing up 
so that there is a natural brief rest between such passages. Down, up, down, up, rest, down, up, rest, down, up. And I'm exaggerating a bit with my whole body to show that, but trying to drive the point home. The next slur that occurs is supposed to be a great surprise and brings us out of our happy sound world of F major into the strum and drawing of D minor. Hear how unexpected it is. I may have actually pushed that a little bit for your benefit, as I realize I'm trying to drive the point home. But of course, there's a sequence there of diminished chords, and diminished chords are very, very powerful things in the music of both Mozart and Haydn, and certainly in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, where, for example, in the cantatas of Bach, one encounters those diminished chords always accompanied by words expressing either the fear of death or death itself. So there's no surprise why every horror movie, when uh, little Goldilocks goes to open the door and everyone tells her, don't open the door, we hear. <laughs> and then, of course, she opens the door. That's why I don't go to many horror movies anymore. But I digress. Back to Mozart. We have. <laughs> this kind of basic feeling. It's very important to vary the sound of such things, lest they lose their power. The first D has to be very powerful. Now we can play perhaps a little bit less. A touch of sadness there. Now we come to the third part of this long phrase, which is itself divided into three parts. So let's be very, very aware of building from this point dynamically. Perhaps we're mezzo piano, mezzo forte here. C minor, A flat major, a little louder. And the arrival. Now we're ready for the actual second theme of the piece, which is in C major. Here, of course, the grace notes have to be played before the main beat, lest we lose the contour of the melody itself. If I play a little bit uh, over pedantically, then the melody is a little bit obscured. Notice also, as Alfredo Casella, in his edition of Mozart, which I'm playing from, points out the uh, similarity here to a certain Verdi aria, which I'll leave you to guess. There's your homework assignment for today. Which is just my way of saying that the music of Mozart is always, always, always very, very vocal. Always be aware of its vocal nature, its vocal implications, and the fact that the music is supposed to portray something of great humanity that we can all identify with. Mm -hmm. 